www.bitcoin.nearpod.com and enter the code UB as in brother W68. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, Detron, Gloria, Neftali. Thank you. Pedro, it's in the chat for the Google Meet, or you can just go to join.nearpod.com. UBW68. UBW68. Braylon, we're waiting on you. Ardeja. Got it. Kathy and Jason, we're waiting on you too. It looks like you guys haven't joined. UBW68. All right. So today is the first day of our ninth unit. We're getting to that end point, guys. The way we've got the struct the, sh the rest of the semester structured is that we'll be we'll spend the next week, the next uh, eight days technically in this ninth unit. We'll be done with this by April 30th, which is next Friday. And then we'll come back on May uh, 3rd, which is the Monday after that. And we'll start our 10th and final unit of the class. So we're really in that final stretch. Fortunately, we, we will have enough time at the end of this semester um, before you all take your EOC to review for about two weeks, which I think is going to be really helpful to you all. Um, and especially to those of us who have come into the class at different points in the semester, it'll be good for us to kind of catch up on some biology knowledge that we've covered previously. Um, but we still need to take these last two units seriously. I'm glad Shade brought it up. Like we're still learning new stuff. Yes, ma'am, we are. We are still going to be going over new material all the way up until uh, really about May 11. So um, we still have we still have a good two, three weeks to cover new material. Um, of course, in that time, we will be reviewing though. So that's why it's so important that, can you guys look up so I know you're listening to me? Thank you, thank, I appreciate, thank you, I appreciate that. I like to see your eyes. Um, so it's important that we do do the warmups, Fraylin, because the, the warmups and the exit tickets are excellent forms of review. That's how we get uh, additional exposure to concepts. And I'm specifically choosing questions that we have struggled with in the past. So if you notice today's warm up was about, uh, had a lot of questions about what? DNA, thank you, Ardeja, somebody did it, excellent. So today's warm up had a lot of questions about DNA um, and that's specific because when I looked at the test results from Tuesday, we struggled a lot with questions that were about DNA. Uh, so we're going to continue to touch on those standards and those concepts, but I need you guys to be getting as much practice as possible doing the warm-ups and exit tickets. Um, and then, of course, we'll be covering things in class during the lectures that will be helpful to you as well. All right. Okay. So, 
So first thing that you guys should write down, who's got their notebooks out? Do you have a notebook, Detron? Something to write with? Okay, that's fine. I love it. I see Naftali is prepared today. I see that Sade has got her notebook out. She's opening it up. Freon is already writing. Pedro is writing. Excellent, excellent. First definition we have today is an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community made up of interacting biotic and abiotic factors. Cindy, uh, we are doing a near pod, so I just sent the link to the chat for you to join. An ecosystem is a community made up of interacting biotic and abiotic factors. What does biotic mean? Living, and what does abiotic mean? Non-living, good. So biotic is living. If you need to write that down, you should. If you're like, mm, I didn't know that, or oh, I could easily forget that, then you should probably write that down as well. Biotic is living, abiotic is non-living. Okay. So we're gonna start this quiz. You guys will have two and a half minutes to answer. Um, it's 10 questions. Really, it's just gonna ask you, it's gonna give you something and it's gonna ask you if it's biotic or if it's abiotic. All right, so all you need to choose is biotic or abiotic. 10 questions, two and a half minutes, starting in three, two, one. Don't say it out loud. Okay, wow, people are finishing up, people are finishing up. We're about halfway through. Excellent job, Breon. Excellent job, Detron. Sade, you're doing quite well. Fraylin, you did really well. Good job, Ardesia. Alex, excellent. Pedro, excellent. job, Gloria. Okay, 
looks like we've got some folks. Chandler, if you're there, keep working. See, you don't have any answers. Jason, you too. Ten seconds, ten seconds. All right, let's take a look. So I'm sharing the data with you all. You should be able to see it now. So cool. let's go over some of these. Some of them were very easy, right? Elephants. Elephants are obviously living. So they're biotic. What else? Trees, again, that's pretty obviously living. Soil, that one maybe could have got, did anybody say biotic for soil? Or was anybody thinking biotic? Why were you, why were you thinking it? Okay. Uh, I have had students in the past make a compelling case that soil is actually biotic because it's got a lot of microorganisms living in it and worms and things. But when we think about soil, we're really thinking about good. Exactly. We want to think about the rocks. Those things are living in the soil, but they don't make up the soil. Thank you, Shade. Couldn't have said it better myself. Grass, pretty obviously living. Viruses. This one may have been a little tough for some folks, but we talked about it last week, right? Viruses are not actually living. They can't reproduce by themselves. They need a host. They need a host to live. Good. Solid carbon. Carbon is just one of those elements. It's number six on that periodic table that's behind you guys, at the back of the room. So of course it's not living. It's just, uh, it's, it's just six protons, six electrons, six neutrons, that's it. Coral. So you guys knew that coral was living, but how many of you knew that coral is actually an animal? It's interesting, right? Coral is, you knew that, Alex? Really? Yeah, it's, coral is an animal, yeah. So it's pretty surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it can reproduce, right? So. It's not a mammal, but of course, they, yeah, it, it does have sperm, it does have eggs, so it, it's a sexually reproducing organism. Um, the atmosphere, of course, the atmosphere is non-living. It's just gases, oxygen, primarily nitrogen. Does anybody know the composition of the atmosphere? The atmosphere is about 78% nitrogen. It's about 21% oxygen. And then the remaining 1% is split up between a lot of different gases, carbon dioxide, neon, uh, argon, helium, all of these things are in very small proportions in the atmosphere. So most of it is nitrogen. Sunlight, that's pretty obviously not living. Bacteria, we talked about this last week as well. Bacteria are living organisms. And that was the last one, all right. Whoa. Okay, we did that. That's good. Okay. So we talked about this just now. Um, there are many different types of ecosystems on the planet Earth, and ecosystems can range in size as well. An ecosystem could be as large as a continent, right? The Sahara Desert is basically as large as Europe. Um, but it could also be its own self-contained pond, right? If there's a self-contained pond and there are plant species living inside of the pond on the floor of the, on the, floor of the pond and there are animal species, fish living there, insects living there, um, there might even be prokaryotic species like different types of bacteria living in the pond. It is its own ecosystem in some ways. So we see this huge range of sizes of ecosystems. Um, but as a part of those ecosystems, it's not just the living things that we have to pay attention to. It's the abiotic factors as well. Um, the amount of rainfall plays a huge factor in what type of ecosystem or what, what type of life is present in the ecosystem. The temperature obviously plays a huge role as well. 
um, humidity, soil quality, air quality, altitude, these things all play a role in the type of ecosystem that we might be talking about. Even in, in, in the ocean, there's you find different ecosystems at different depths, right? So if you're closer to the surface, the first 50 feet, you find certain types of animals that when you get down two miles under the surface, you will not find those types of life there. All right, so this is just something I just wanted to be a little goofy with you guys. Which would you rather be dropped off in the middle of, the Pacific Ocean or the Sahara Desert? Just give me an answer and we'll just see where people's preferences lie. You just get dropped off. Which one would you rather be in, the ocean or the desert? Okay, let's take 10 more seconds, 10 seconds to get an answer in here. Again, this doesn't really matter, just pure interest. Okay. So we can see, it looks like over half of us would rather be in the desert. Only 31% of people say ocean. I guess, what, what do you say about that, Briam? What did you say? Why? Why did you pick desert? Okay, yeah, I, I, I think your survival chances are probably a little bit better in the desert then and even if you yeah most people yeah you're probably right about that too because it's you know it'd be hard to spot somebody in the in the desert um <laughs> so it's a, that's a tough choice tough choice okay so again all of those abiotic factors that i just mentioned play a role in the types of ecosystems we find on the planet Earth. So uh, we can see clearly the largest desert is the Sahara Desert. That's that big pink section right here in Northern Africa. But then there is the Namib, the, the Namib Desert down there. We've also got the Atacama Desert that's in Chile. Um, we've got deserts that appear in the Middle East and in uh, Central Asia as well. Then we, of course, have um, forests that cover large portions of Russia, large portions of Canada. Um, but then we also have tropical forests that, you know, the Amazon covers most of Brazil. Um, we've got Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia are also, and then Central America has a lot of tropical forests as well. Um, probably a lot of people didn't know that Central Africa has tropical forests. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is largely a forest nation. And then the Indonesian countries are also, um, considered tropical forest. We've got prairies as well. Um, where we are would be considered temperate mixed forest, which is interesting. We're gonna talk a lot more about the ecosystem here in North Carolina tomorrow. Um, and then there are tundras as well, which are, you know, have been covered by ice for the last 10,000 years or so. Okay, so interesting. And, and all, latitude, altitude, proximity to oceans, all of these things determine which type of biome, which ecosystems we're looking at. Okay. So my question is, what is the relationship between biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem? Which one depends on which? What do you all think? Let me, let me. Let me ask that question here. Have an activity. Um, open ended. What is the relationship between 
biotic and abiotic factors, which depends on which. All right, so go ahead. I'll hide your names so you guys don't have to be embarrassed about what you want to say. I'll hide your names. Go ahead and give me an answer to those to those questions or one of those questions. What is the relationship between biotic and abiotic factors? Which one depends on which? Yeah, you can put an example. Just give me an answer. Good. So someone says abiotic factors do not depend on biotic factors for their existence. I think that's that's largely true. That is largely true. Now somebody might be able to make a case against that, and we'll talk more about that. Um, someone says one is living and the other is not living, but they both help us human beings in the ecosystem. So true. Obviously, we don't consider water living, but water is absolutely essential to human survival. And it's also essential to our economy. It's essential to how we cr create energy. We need water to produce energy. You know, the electricity that we have is only available to us because of water. Um, so we need water. It's not living. But of course, we need living things to survive as well. We need food. Um, biotic factors depend on the surrounding abiotic factors. That's a good summary. They both need each other kind of ish in order to live like, for example, biotic animal, biotic is giving me the whole thing. Um, biotic feed on abiotic things. Okay. Yep. So I think we're getting the gist here. Biotic factors certainly need abiotic factors. Oh, you're going. You're 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 on the you're you're on the right track. Keep going. Keep going. Grass is by oh, did you were you gonna say something, Deshaun? You said never mind. <laughs> Brian, were you gonna add something? Because of what? That's a great example. Great example. <laughs> the relationship between abiotic and biotic. Abiotic, which is non-living organisms, depend on biotic, which is living organisms, to survive. Okay, so 
actually, let me just for the people that I love, I got two examples and I just want to repeat them for the folks at home. Um, Sade used the example of grass. Grass is obviously a biotic, it's a living organism, but it needs the sunlight, which is abiotic, to do photosynthesis. So we see how it depends on an abiotic factor. And then Brian gave us another great example as well. He talked about viruses. Viruses are abiotic, they're not living, but viruses need biotic things in order to be passed on, right? They need a host, they need a living host. That's a great example of how an abiotic factor depends on biotic factors as well. So you guys were right on track there. Good job. Uh, and I tried, tried to summarize it. So biotic factors depend on abiotic factors for survival. We need water for uh, respiration. Oh, sorry, we need water for photosynthesis. We need sunlight for photosynthesis. We need um, glucose for respiration. Glucose is abiotic, it's not living. We need shelter, right? We need all of these things that are, that are non-living. But biotic factors can influence their environments as well. We see animals that have huge influences on the soil quality. They can cut things, they can carve things. Um, they decide where, in some cases, where plants grow. We know that, um, Plants rely on other animals to, to reproduce, to carry their pollen. So we see this, how the ecosystem is very reliant upon all of its parts. That's so important to remember. So we talked about the levels of organization for um, living organisms, for species. You don't need to write this down, but it's just kind of cool to consider. Here are the levels of organization in an ecosystem. The biosphere is the part of the earth containing all of its ecosystems. It's basically the entire earth. It also includes the atmosphere as well. Um, ecosystem is multiple communities of biotic organisms interacting with abiotic factors. So you have different species interacting with one another, living in the same place, mating in the same place. They might be competing for resources. They might even be in a predator prey relationship with one another, which we'll talk more about. Yeah, we're going to talk more. We're going to, it's about the transition. Hum, the human impact on the environment. Uh, communities are, a community is multiple populations that live together in a defined area. A population is multiple organisms of the same species living together in a group. And an organism is obviously an individual, an individual animal or an individual plant or even an individual uh, unicellular life form, like a, like a bacterial cell. Okay, so we're going to watch this cool video. Um, and I want you all, as we watch it, to think about how humans around the world, so not just here in the United States, but how humans over time and over space all over the world have influenced the planet in both good and bad ways. And as you think about that, I want you to think about the impact that you personally are having on the planet? What are some things that you do that might be good for the planet? And what are some things that you do that might be bad for the planet? Fun fact. Planet Earth is 4.5 billion years old. Mankind, about 140,000 years old. Let me put that in perspective. If you condense the Earth's lifespan into 24 hours, that's one full day, then we have been here on this planet for, drum roll please, three seconds. Three seconds. And look what we've done. We have modestly named ourselves homo sapiens, meaning wise men. But is man really so wise? Smart, yes, and it's good to be smart, but not smart for your own. Yes, we have split the atom. Yes, we build clever machines that navigate the universe in search of new homes. But at the same time, those atoms we split in a new warfare. In our quest to explore the galaxy, rejects and neglects the home that we have here now. So no, that can wisdom. Wisdom is different. 
while intelligence speaks with us and we willingly covered our ears to mother nature's screams and closed our eyes to all of her help wanted signs wisdom knows that every action has an equal and opposite reaction so if we were wise we would not be shocked when we see storms that are stronger than ever before or more drought hurricanes and wildfire than ever before because there's more pollution than ever before, more carbon, more trees cut down than ever before. At a record pace, we increase the extinction of animals by 1,000 times the normal. What a feat. In the next 10 to 100 years, every beloved animal character in every children's book is predicted to go extinct. Lions gone, rhinos gone, tiger, gorilla, elephant, polar bear gone. In three seconds. Species that have been here longer than us be gone because of us. This three seconds. It's shorter than a vine VO. We turn the soul of life into our own personal veil belt. Somebody, anybody help. We were given so much. The only planet the system with life. I mean, we are one in a million. No, actually, scientifically, one in a billion trillion. trillion. That's a one forty-three row. And I don't want to get spiritual, but how we not a we are perfectly positioned the sun so we don't burn but not too distant so we don't turn to ice goldilocks said it best we are just right this paradise where we are given medicine from trees not coincidentally but because like the song says we are our family literally everything every species is connected genetically from the sunflower to the sunfish and this is what we must recognize before it's too late because the real crisis is not global warming environmental destruction or animal agriculture it is us these problems are symptoms of us byproducts of us art reflection loss of connection has created this misdirection we have forgotten everything tributes to the perfection of mother nature corporations keep us unaware and disconnected but they have underestimated our strength contrary to popular belief millions are waking up out of their sleep seeing our home being taken right up under our feet we cannot allow our history to be written by the wicked greedy and loony it is our duty to protect mother nature from those who refuse to see her beauty call me crazy but I believe we should like to eat food that's safe the ingredients we can pronounce drink water that clean marvel at Free and free of toxins. These aspects, not things that bargain for in Congress. So they want you to feel powerless. But it has been said that something as small as the flutter of a butterfly's wing can cause a typhoon halfway around the world. But when enough people come together, we too will make waves and watch the world into a new era filled with love and connection, freedom for all with oppression. But it is up to you, yes, you watching this behind this screen to make the effort because time is of the essence and together can we make it to the fourth second Okay, so now we've got a collaborate board. So your your um, posts will be visible to your classmates. But the question is, again, now that you've seen the video, um, and I wanted you to think as you watch the video about your personal impact on the planet. Now I want you to answer that question. In what ways have you personally contributed in both good and bad ways? So I know it asks about how you've harmed the planet, but think about some ways that you may have helped the planet. Do you recycle? Do you plant? Do you have a garden? Yes, Brian. Yes, that's that's true. And we'll talk more about that. Um, so on this collaborate board, just type out a, a couple sentences. In what ways have humans harmed the planet? And in what ways have you personally contributed to the harm? All right, so that's a good example, Brian. You might want to type that one out. The use of hairsprays and aerosols what else what else yes sir yes i'm going to show student names cars buses 
Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, Sade. Let's get some more participation here. So in what ways have human, what have you guys heard of? I know you watch these documentaries. You see these TikToks. What do you? Oh, the can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Landfills, good. Landfills are a big problem. You know, people. The waste in New York City ends up being put on a train. Can I? Oh my gosh. Go ahead. Yes. So when people when people uh, go to the bathroom in New York City, you know, they do their business. It ends up being transported on a train to the state of Alabama because they run out of landfill space in New York. So their poop is literally going, and you know, it smells bad as it's. <laughs> Good, we've got burning buildings and stores, killing innocent lives. That's not, yeah, that's, that's true, that's true. That definitely harms the planet. Um, burning coal, yeah, that's, that's not good. Factories that create lots of pollution in the air. Mining, that's a good one too. Mining is a big problem. Um, killing animals for food. And is anybody here a vegetarian? Anybody a vegetarian here? Fraylin, you don't eat meat? Good, good. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna leave this up for a couple more seconds to see if we get any more creative answers. Um, keeping the animals that benefit us and forgetting the ones that don't. Yeah, that's, that's sad, that's sad. We know that we get a lot of different medicines. It's not just food that we get from animals. We get medicines from them that are really helpful that you know a lot of people don't even think about. Um, so causing them to go extinct, has a, it has a domino effect. Fortunately, we have not had any nuclear war, wars yet, but we did drop bombs in, in Japan, would you say? Yeah, the bombs that were dropped in Japan. Yeah, that's a that was that was that was bad. Pollution, good. So that's what we're getting ready to talk about. Seems like you guys already have a good grasp on some of the things that are going on, but we want to talk about specifically some of the things that humans have done to hurt the planet. So, what is the impact of this human activity? What impact does this human activity have? Interstate highway systems. How has that impacted the uh, the planet? Good destruction of habitat. That's a great way of saying it. What else could we could we say about that? What does that mean, Ayana? Destruction of habitat. Good. Good, so um, this space that we're seeing, and we can even see some trees that are still there and some grassy area that is still there. At one point, the entire space would have just been forest essentially, or maybe even prairie. And so it would have been home to a lot of different plant and animal species. Um, by building these highway systems, we drove those plant and animal species elsewhere. And some of them unfortunately may no longer exist. We can also think about uh, the pollution, you know, we've got a lot of cars driving through on these highway systems, so they're polluting the, the surrounding area. And it's not just polluting with chemicals, it's also sound pollution as well. Some birds are very, very sensitive to sound. They don't like to be near really noisy um, highways. And so what that means is that their migratory patterns might be thrown off. Um, it could also be uh, the heat pollution. So we know that concrete absorbs heat, or I'm sorry, it reflects heat feet a lot more than grass does. So if you're in an area, in an urban area like the city of Charlotte, the average temperature is actually higher than the surrounding rural area because all the concrete and all of the, the metal is reflecting that heat rather than absorbing it and using it for photosynthesis. So um, that's also a problem as well. What about this? How have humans led to this. This is called the Great Garbage Patch and it's in the Pacific Ocean.
Exactly. So, um, Breon just gave a great answer. To summarize, we're dumping trash in into our oceans. Sometimes it's not being dumped directly into the ocean, but it might go into a river, and then that river flows to the ocean. Um, the the surprising statistic is that we dump approximately a garbage truck worth of plastic into the ocean every single second. Hard to believe, but it's true. And there's a um, there's literally a patch of garbage that's in the Pacific Ocean that's larger than the state of Texas. Um, and we really can't do much about it. Some of the plastic is already breaking down and it's becoming what's called a microplastic to the point where you can't really pick it up. But animals, they, um, the fish that live in the ocean are, are eating it, or even if they're not eating it, they're absorbing it. And then of course we eat those fish. So we are literally eating the plastic that uh, has been dumped into the into the ocean. Some of it is done intentionally because people are breaking the law and they're dumping their trash into the ocean. Uh, yeah, it's that much. It is that much. Most of it is is uh, as a result of the fishing industry as well. So you'll see a lot of fishing nets. You'll see a lot of buoys. Um, but if let you know if those things are left in the water and they're exposed to the sunlight and they're exposed to the waves they break down over time. And so they become smaller and smaller. And eventually it gets to the point where you, we have no way of collecting it. We can't pick it up because it's too small. And that's when the fish start to absorb it. Um, and then the smallest fish get eaten by larger fish and then we eat the larger fish. And so we're eating, we're eating the plastic. What about this? How, have human, how has human activity led to flooding? Any idea? Okay. So because we are, because we've contributed to global warming, it's melting the ice and the melting ice. Now we're not talking about a little amount of ice. We're talking about tons and tons of ice every year. And so thousands of tons of ice. So it's contributing to rising sea levels. So you guys, have, has anybody been to New Orleans or Miami? These are both places that are very, very close to the ocean. And that's part of their appeal, right? So, but as we see over time, both of those cities are gonna be wiped out by rising sea levels. If we don't, you know, we have essentially nine years at this point um, until 2030 to make significant changes to the ways that we have um, been living our lives. If not, we can expect to see, you know, only, essentially with only one meter of sea level rise, the city of New Orleans is gonna be flooded. Within three meters of sea level rise, which is really not that much, the city of Miami will be flooded. And if you look up here, this is South Carolina. So, you know, some South Carolinian cities will be flooded out. You know, the entire the Key West, if you've ever heard of Key West or the Florida Keys, they're being flooded. They'll be underwater. Okay, so we don't have much time to do these things. There's another one. Yes. Now, most of the impact is not going to be found in the United States. Most of it will be in other places, you know, like the Philippines and um, to Indonesia and some African countries. But again, you can see even in North Carolina, if 
the water would arise 10 feet, Rocky Mount would be would be flooded. Greenville would be flooded. Fayetteville would be close to being flooded. Wilmington is gone. These are all places that you all have heard of. So it would have profound impacts on the entire East Coast. The city of New York is going to be flooded. All right, so um, that is that is in fact human impact. Again, and this is basically the same thing, melting ice caps in the Arctic. What about hurricanes? Any, any thoughts about that? Does anybody know how humans have, or how human, in, human activity has led to this? Of course, there were hurricanes long before humans. Right, hurricanes have been a weather event on the planet Earth since there was water on planet Earth. But why are they getting worse? They're getting worse because the temperature is is rising. Right, it's getting it's it's getting hotter, and the rising temperature contributes to um, different pressure systems. And it's the pressure systems that cause these hurricanes and that make them a lot more dangerous, a lot larger, and it makes them um, more frequent as well. All right, so specifically in this class, we wanna focus on these seven spaces, these seven areas of human impact, population growth, pollution, climate change, burning fossil fuels, the introduction of what we call invasive species, ozone depletion, and bioaccumulation. So you guys are going to explore these different um, problems as a part of your asynchronous activity for the day. And then um, you'll define them and, and that's, that's what we'll talk about the next time as well. All right, so I'll stop here for now. Let me go all the way to... So we don't have much time. I know we only have about 13 minutes, but you guys can open up that assignment on Canvas and get started with it. Um, it is gonna show you those same slides that I just kind of skipped through. All you need to do is define those different phenomenon or phenomena in your own words, and then talk about what's gonna happen, You know what the human consequences will be. All right, so the assignment is called U9D1, Human Impact on the Environment. Vitron, you still don't have access to Canvas? Okay. Um, don't worry about the exit ticket right now. Just jump straight into the activity.
Yes. So what? The Black Plague? No, that was caused by um, a virus. It was kind of our fault that we lived in such uh, unsanitary conditions at the time because the Black Plague was, was carried by rodents, basically. Um, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a, a human caused event. Does Canvas let you save your progress? If you start an assignment, can you save it and come back to it? You can? Yeah. Okay.
All right, folks, have a great day. We've got one more day this week. I'll see you on Friday. Peace out.